Please be seated. Please stand. Before I say anything else, I've been asked to ask you to make sure you've turned off your mobile telephones. Excellencies, magnificences, distinguished guests, founder, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Central European University is honoured by your presence at this ceremony, the inauguration of CEU's fourth president and rector, John Shatter. CEU was founded and funded in 1991 by Mr. George Soros, and so it is a young university. Its students are studying for masters and doctoral degrees, and it is accredited in both Hungary and the United States. It's a truly international university. Its 1,100 or so students come from around 100 countries, and its faculty from about 30. I'm Howard Robinson, Provost and Academic Pro-Rector of CEU and Master of Ceremonies for today. CEU is very pleased to be able to hold this ceremony in this beautiful historic building, originally planned as the Hungarian Ministry of Justice. Although an international institution, CEU is firmly rooted in Budapest and proud to be part of this noble city and its cultural and intellectual life. The first moment in this ceremony is a performance of Brahms' Academic Festival Overture. We are very pleased to have to play for us the orchestra of the Budapest Philharmonic Society, which is the orchestra of the Budapest's famous opera. The conductor will be Leon Botstein, who as well as being the chair of CEU's Board of Trustees and President of Bard College, is a renowned musicologist and conductor of both the American Symphony Orchestra and the Jerusalem Symphony Orchestra. Leon.
Many thanks to the orchestra and to Leon. Before I proceed, I just want to ask, is this loudspeaker far too loud, or does it only sound that way to me? Is it all right out there? It's all right, fine, I'm sorry. <clears throat> we come now to the ceremonial inauguration of Professor John Shattuck as Rector President. Leon Botstein, as Chair of the Board, will perform this ceremony. As I mentioned earlier, CEU is a young institution and has few traditions. You may, know, you may know the story of the English public school headmaster who used to post notices which read, there will be a tradition from today that. CEU does not go in for this artificial manufacturing of traditions. We do, however, have one genuine tradition that stretches back into the mists of the 1990s. We have a chain of office for the rector president, which Leon Botstein will now present. University presidents are ceremonial officers as well as substantive officers. And the public, almost Greco-Roman dimension of this ceremony in this neoclassical environment is absolutely appropriate. So there is an investiture. It has a somewhat religious connotation. I don't have a mitre and no staff, but we do have a seal of office, and it is traditional that the new president and rector be given this seal of office. It is an honor and pleasure on behalf of the Board of Trustees to invest John Shattuck with the office as the fourth president and rector of the Central European University, a university dedicated to being different and excellent and serving the public welfare and appropriate to this hall, the causes of justice and truth in contemporary civilization. So it is with great honor and humility that we as the trustees present you with the seal of office and invest you with it. And this is the object. And in Latin, it says the Central U European University. And I now formally invest you in the office of the presidency. George Soros is not only the founder of CEU, he is world famous as an investor, as a philanthropist, and as a critic of the world economic order. I'm sure many of you heard some of his lectures last week, sponsored by CEU and held at the Hungarian Academy of Science, which were beamed all over the world. Mr. Soros. <coughs> well, the uh, most uh, hackneyed phrase that one could use on the occasion of the inauguration of uh, a new rector that it, it inaugurates a, a new epoch or a new phase in the life of the university. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to say. And on this occasion, I really mean it and I think that uh, this will have some real substance uh, behind it. Uh, the university was founded uh, at the height of the collapse of the Soviet empire uh, when I established a network of foundations that covered uh, the pretty well the entire former Soviet empire as well as Yugoslavia. And the university was meant to be the brain center of this network of foundations. Now, as it turned out, this was a stillborn idea, not the first one and not the last one of these ideas. Uh, because the university, as an, as an academic institution, wanted to establish, and quite rightly so, its independence, and did not want to be 
closely linked to a network of foundations. It was a bad idea, and I, one of my, I think, uh, qualities is to be able to recognize bad ideas. Um, and so we allowed the university to, de to develop uh, entirely independently, and there was relatively little connection between the network of foundations and the university. Nevertheless, I've always felt the need for a closer uh, connection. And setting up a school of public policy will provide that link. The, actually, the foundation network needs a brain center. And uh, as I reach a certain age, I think about the future. Uh, originally, I didn't want the foundations to actually uh, 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 live be beyond my lifetime. Um, but I changed my mind as, uh, because the foundation has a, a, a mission that should be carried on. Uh, but the foundation also has a certain quality of uh, venturesomeness, uh, of exploring new possibilities. And I didn't want the, founda the foundation to lose that quality. And I think that if one has a, a, a school of public policy, uh, it will greatly help to be always at the cutting edge of what, the, what history is bringing, the new problems that confront us, and will, will enable the foundation to renew itself and to be always at, at the cutting edge. Um, and at the same time, I think that the School of Public Policy will greatly benefit from the practical experience of the foundation. It will be a unique combination of the practical and the theoretical. So I think that the, this the school has the, the chance of being really uh, an outstanding uh, uh, institution of considerable significance. Um, and that is the the uh, beginning of this school. Um, and I'm very pleased that uh, the new uh, rector sees that as an important aspect of his work. But of course, uh, I hope that the rest of the university will also develop in, in, a, in a, 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 a um, a new direction, uh, not a new direction, but develop further. And there, I would say that <coughs> uh, I also see a, a new phase in my own personal involvement in the university. Um, because um, I, in the course of my lifetime, I did develop a conceptual framework I will not inflict it on you now uh, because I held a series of lectures last week where I, ex where I expounded it. Uh, and I would like that conceptual framework based basically on critical thinking um, and the recognition of how important misconceptions are in shaping uh, 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 real, uh, history. Uh, I hope that it will find a, ho a home uh, at, at, at the university. And I, now that I have uh, again retired from my uh, business, uh, I intend to spend more time at, at the university and, and uh, uh, be also personally uh, participating in, in it. Uh, I have uh, avoided inflicting 
my uh, conceptual framework on the university, uh, but I feel that it's, it's, it's appropriate that I should now uh, expose it, the university uh, uh, to it. And uh, I'm really very, very pleased. Incidentally, the, the fact that, that the, the new rector uh, uh, has a vision which I, he will explain in, in a few minutes, uh, which coincides uh, uh, with mine. Uh, what I'm saying sh should not in any way uh, diminish the role of the previous rector, uh, who was fully aware of these plans and was rearing uh, to introduce them and I actually had to restrain them from doing so until the new rector arrives. So I, I, don't want in, in, I don't want to diminish his contribution in, in any way. But uh, um, uh, this is the, the future that I foresee, and I, I hope that the university will develop into something really significant that will make a contribution uh, to make the world a better place. And I would like the, rec the rector to give you his vision as he joins the university. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George, uh, uh, so much for everything. I want to express my gratitude, as all of us do, to the founder of this university for all he has done, and particularly, I think, for his uh, extraordinary series of lectures last week, which uh, virtually relaunched CEU uh, from his own uh, new intellectual contribution. I also want to recognize, and I think this is, I think I am, tr I think this is a true statement that I am the only university president who has ever had the opportunity to be inaugurated under the baton of the chairman of the board of that university. So I'm thrilled, Leon, and thank you for all that you've done. And I want to also thank the uh, members of the Budapest Philharmonic Society who have performed uh, here and will perform uh, more. I'm grateful for the presence of uh, many ambassadors. I think your presence reflects the great international diversity of CEU. I'm honored by the presence of my longtime friend and colleague, Richard Goldstone, from whom you'll hear in a few moments. Richard, your commitment to the international rule of law and your courage in pursuit of that commitment have inspired people around the world. And I thank you and your wife, Nolene, uh, for being here on this very, very special occasion. Uh, I greet all the leaders of the cultural and business and civic organizations in Budapest who are here today and thank you for coming. CEU is proud to be a Hungarian as well as an American and European university and we are privileged to play a role in the cultural and intellectual life of this country and this region. And I thank the leaders and members of the boards of CEU and its sister organization, the Open Society Institute especially my longtime colleague and friend and first boss, Arya Nair, who was sitting here in the front row. He hired me many, many years ago to work in the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, I thank you for your support and, and friendship, uh, all members of the board of both institutions uh, as I begin my term. Um, I owe a special debt of gratitude to the faculty and staff and students who've put me through a very rigorous training session in preparation for today. Um, I'm especially grateful to Howard Robinson, the provost, and Liviu Mate, the chief operating officer, and many, many others. As you might imagine, I feel a special kinship to the new students, and I know there are uh, some new students here today, so uh, consider that I'm one of you up here on the stage 
Um, I ran into a new student the other day in uh, one of the corridors of the great maze of buildings that we all know as C and love as CEU. Uh, we were both lost and somehow miraculously we're, we managed to find our way out together. Um, finally and above all, I want to thank my partner in life and fellow adventurer in Budapest, my wife Ellen, who has guided all of our journeys, made them endlessly fun, and even when I make them endlessly challenging. The greatest tribute I can give to her is to quite literally say I wouldn't be standing here without you. Let me add that we're both very grateful to our children uh, who gave us permission to come to Budapest. We had to seek a special dispensation from them because they are tolerant of our endlessly peripatetic ways and know that no matter where we are, family will always be at the center of our lives. Two years ago, when I was at Harvard, a new president was inaugurated. I remember thinking at the time how quaint it was for a university president to deliver an inaugural address and how challenging it must be on such an occasion to figure out what to say. Little did I know that I would soon find out. Inaugural addresses are a peculiar genre, observed the new president of Harvard. They are by definition pronouncements by people who don't yet know what they're talking about sounded about right to me at the time, and it certainly sounds even more so today. After their inauguration, university presidents often seem to disappear into the woodwork. A former president of Brown University in the United States once remarked that, and I quote, a president is expected to speak continuously in words that charm and never offend, to take bold positions with which no one will disagree, to consult with everyone and follow all proffered advice, and to do everything through committees but with great speed and without error. Now, I agree that a university president should charm and consult and work through committees, but not always. Sooner or later, a president will face a moment when it's time to challenge the prevailing wisdom, to tell an inconvenient truth, or defend an unpopular position. That's the time when presidents are tested and too often they fail. In the United States, too many presidents stood by and said nothing when academic freedom was undermined by the tirades of Senator Joe McCarthy. Not enough spoke out against the pervasive racism in American society and on campus. Only a handful, including the chairman of our board, Leon Botstein, challenged the use of torture in the so-called war on terror. And here in Central Europe, very few were at the forefront of movements to resist the repression of old regimes. A university president should defend the principles of open society, freedom of speech and thought, equality of opportunity and treatment and democracy. These are values that should divine a, president, a university and they are the values on which CEU was founded. One of the great chapters in the long struggle to develop an open society was written by Abraham Lincoln, whose bicentennial we celebrate this year. In the eye of the storm of the American Civil War, a conflict as old as civilization was fought over whether human beings could enslave one another. That was the moment when the modern concept of democracy was defined. As I would not be a slave, Lincoln said, so I would not be a master. This, is, this expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the dis difference is no democracy, he said. Another historic moment came 125 years later, in 1989, when a peaceful revolution swept through Central and Eastern Europe and simultaneously through South Africa, where Justice Goldstone played a major role in the struggle against apartheid, and then to the East through Russia and Central Asia. And it was out of that revolution that this university was born. It was conceived out of a promise and an idea the promise was that when the walls came down, 
students and professors from across the world could come together to teach and learn and build something new. The idea was that an international university where people are free to inquire and experiment and take risks could become a laboratory for open society. Today, the peaceful revolution for democracy and human rights faces ever new barriers all over the world. The international financial crisis, the struggle over resources and the environment, the rise of a new authoritarianism, and the populist appeal of aggressive nationalism. These are today's challenges to open society. But the promise and the idea out of which CEU was born remain strong. We have become a global university with students from over 100 countries. We have a widely respected faculty and academic departments immersed in the study of society. The vision and generosity of our founder have made us financially stable. And because of our strength and our mission, I believe we have a special responsibility to respond to the great challenges of our time. How shall we do this? Let's look at who we are. We have deep regional roots and a global perspective. We are a crossroads university, located here in Budapest, accessible from east and west, north and south, rooted in the history and culture of Central and Eastern Europe, and open as few other universities are to the history and culture of other regions. Our roots in this region can be seen in the origins of many of our faculty and students and in the curricula of some of our academic subjects. For example, medieval studies, European history, EU enlargement, regional markets. Our global perspective comes from our many students from Africa, Asia, North and South America, and from programs that address global problems in economics, environmental science, human rights, and public policy, to name just a very few. Another special quality is our close integration of theory and practice. We are committed to academic inquiry in the pursuit of knowledge and civic engagement in the pursuit of open society. Our public policy department is at the center of this integration, but many other departments also benefit from case studies and field work in the real world. A third unique characteristic is our commitment to interdisciplinary study and research. Individual disciplines have their own integrity, but today's challenges must be addressed across disciplines. From global warming to failed states to social inequality, problems that affect the world must be studied by teams of specialists and generalists who combine scientific analysis with practical experience. As a young university with fewer academic turf wars, at least I think so far, than most, CEU is well positioned to be a leader in inter interdisciplinary studies. To do all this, we must be agile, and that's our fourth special quality. A dynamic university must be able to take risks, develop new programs, combine or discontinue outmoded programs, keep focused on its mission, and not get distracted by projects that consume resources without adding value. Because CEU is young, small, and entrepreneurial, we have a great capacity to be nimble, and this will achieve, help us achieve our goals. Finally, we have a mission. We are a new model for international education, a research center for regional and global studies, and a source of intellectual support for open society. We educate students to be citizens and leaders of the world rooted in their own communities, tolerant and engaged with others, and above all, committed to a set of values. Pursuit of the truth wherever it may lead. Honest assessment of history. Openness to new ideas. Respect for the dignity of individuals and groups. Commitment to the rule of law and determination to resolve differences through debate, not denial. In the months ahead, as you have heard from our founder, 
we will launch the largest and most ambitious project CEU has yet undertaken. We will build a new international school of public policy. This project is being launched in another revolutionary time, not unlike the time when the Berlin Wall came down two decades ago. The economic crisis has shaken the foundations of our world, and tremors coming from threats to the environment and public health and democracy and human rights are not far behind. Which institutions will collapse from these man-made earthquakes, and what new ones will have to be created? It's too early to tell, but it's clear that many things will change. CEUs, School of Public Policy, and CEUs departments across the university will be a laboratory to study that change. Most public policy schools are focused on governments and the countries where they're located. CEU will be different. We will focus on civil societies and transnational institutions. And at the core of our approach will be a relationship to the Open Society Institute through OSI and its network of foundations. CEU will bring academic experts together with practitioners and advocates involved in policy development in six broad areas. Governance and the rule of law, regulation and finance, delivery of public services, human security, media and communications, and civil society and NGO studies. CEU's academic departments will all be involved in developing the new curriculum and will also be involved in their own, each in their own disciplines in those curricular developments. When it is built, the School of Public Policy will pull together, I believe, the many strands of CEU and turn the university into a rich tapestry unlike any other in the world. This is an exciting time and I'm privileged to lead CEU into it. Let me close with a personal story. In many ways, it relates to this university. Two decades ago, I was devastated by the loss of my first wife. She was born in Germany, grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust, and came to America as an au pair girl so she could learn about things that were not discussed at home. She went to university on a scholarship, got her PhD, became a professor and an advocate for human rights. She wondered if the world would ever change. Then it did, but she didn't live to see it. My world collapsed. I was left with three young children and darkness. I rediscovered the light when I met Ellen, who taught me what matters most in life, and showed me her passion as a journalist for speaking truth to power, no matter what the cost. We were married and soon had a fourth child, born the same year as CEU. Later, as CEU and our daughter were growing up, I was a diplomat in Yugoslavia, working to end the conflict there. And then in the Czech Republic, where civil society was emerging from the long darkness that had enveloped the region of CEU's birth. Now this university has grown up, and so has our daughter. They are prepared to play a role in the world, and I'm prepared to help them do that. It will be a principled role, defined by the values of open society. In pursuing those values, we must never be starry-eyed, but rooted here in the real world. And I believe, in conclusion, that we can do no better than to follow the credo of one of the founders of this great university, Václav Havel, who once said, I am not an optimist because I do not believe that all ends well, nor am I a pessimist because I do not believe all ends badly. Instead, I'm a realist who carries an ideal, and the ideal is that freedom has meaning and is always worth the struggle. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. It's difficult to imagine a more suitable person to lead CEU into the future years than someone who began his career in the civil rights struggle, continued it by making, or helping to make peace in Yugoslavia, 
and who has spent the whole of his life defending human rights and international law. Thank you. To continue, as it were, a similar theme, I will now ask Professor Ronata Uitz, Chair of the Comparative Constitutional Law Programme at CEU, to introduce our guest speaker, Justice Richard Goldstone. In a few moments, you will be listening to Justice Richard Goldstone address. And Justice Goldstone barely needs an introduction. And it would certainly take much longer than I have today to provide a comprehensive account on his outstanding career. Instead, I would like to remind ourselves how Justice Goldstone's engagement and achievements are intertwined in numerous and sometimes intricate ways with the mission, spirit, and undertakings of this university. His profound commitment to democracy and human rights, to building better, just, and decent societies is signified by the tasks he decided to perform. He is well known to have chaired the Commission of Investigation, which by now is simply known as the Goldstone Commission, uh, which was instrumental to bringing down apartheid in his native South Africa. He is equally famous for having served as a prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and he has been involved in numerous inquiries to explore vast human rights violations across the globe. What is striking about his assignments is that they were not at all hopeful in the beginning, and they were immensely risky. They turned out to be path-breaking and formative of principles about democracy building, human rights protection, and international humanitarian law as we know them today. The Goldstone Commission paved the way for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is still the best known example of facing grave past injustice. The South African Constitutional Court, where Justice Goldstone also served, is the ultimate reference point for proper understandings of dignity and equality, for the enforcement of social welfare rights, and even for the rights of same-sex families. Uh, and also, Without the international criminal tribunals, we would not be speaking today about fundamental obligations in armed conflicts, which by now are also acknowledged as basic principles of international humanitarian law, nor would the international criminal court be an inevitable institution for many of us to have. In addition to having the courage to enter uncharted waters, Justice Goldstone is known to be committed to the quest for truth in the midst of turmoil, suffering, and controversy. He understands better than most how revealing the truth through meticulous investigation and open deliberation is instrumental to serving justice and building lasting peace in even after the most despicable horrors. When he was chairing the International Independent Inquiry in Kosovo, CEU in 2000 was one of the five sites where the Commission held workshops and where intensive deliberation was carried out to inform the final report. His commitment is best evidenced by Justice Goldstone's accepting to chair the UN Commission's inquiry into human rights violations in the Gaza Strip recently, a task which was expected to and indeed did trigger harsh reactions from all sides. It is a real honor to have Justice Goldstone among us today. He stands as a clear example of how far commitment to truth, justice, and human rights can take one in building a better future, even out of the worst forms of oppression and violence. Good morning. It was with very great delight that I accepted the invitation to deliver the address at the inauguration of John Shattuck as the fourth president and rector of the Central European University. Apart from the distinct honor in having chosen me to speak at the ceremony, I was, I'm so happy to be able to celebrate this event both with John and his outstanding and supportive wife, Ellen. My friendship with John Shattuck goes back to my days as the first Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and later for Rwanda. It took the Security Council some 14 months to reach agreement on the appointment of a Chief Prosecutor 
And during that period, the credibility of the Yugoslavia tribunal tumbled. It had all but disappeared. And without the support, the active support of the administration of President Bill Clinton, the institution would certainly not have become both vibrant and successful. The support came importantly at that, at that crucial time from the United States Permanent Representative at the United Nations, Ambassador then, Ambassador Madeleine Albright, and the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labour, John Shattuck. I'm delighted too that we have uh, with us here this morning two other early important supporters of the tribunal, George Soros and Arya Naya. Since those heady days when the first ever truly international criminal tribunals were established, John and I have met in many cities around the world, in Kigali, Rwanda, at an international fundraising meeting for the Rwanda Tribunal, at the Salzburg Global Seminar on Salzburg when John was the United States Ambassador to the Czech Republic, and, and a number of times in Boston uh, when John served as the president of the John F. Kennedy Library. I also had the pleasure and enjoyment of sharing classes with John Shattuck when he taught courses on diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University outside Boston. There, at John's invitation, I was able to witness his outstanding teaching talent, and I envied his students who were benefiting so much from it. It is all those experiences and talent that will serve John so well in this new position leading the Central European University. What a splendid decision this university took when it decided to invite John Shattuck to become its president and rector. I have also one connection with the CEU. In April 2000, the members of the Kosovo Commission, established by the Prime Minister of Sweden, Goran Persson, met on this campus where it held both business meetings and participated in a very lively and important seminar with experts from the region. The work of that commission helped pave the way to the recognition of the doctrine now called the responsibility to protect. I recall during that visit being taken on, being taken on a tour of your impressive library with its unusual holdings of documents relating to the International War Crimes Tribunal and I look forward to another visit there this afternoon. Allow me now to turn to what I consider the topic of the remarks I want to make, and that is the movement towards an international rule of law. It is now generally recognized that democracy depends not only on regular and fair elections, but rather, and I would suggest more importantly, on respect for the rule of law. We should not forget that Hitler, Milosevic, and Mugabe came to, came to power or retained power in consequence of elections that were generally considered to be free and fair. It was the subversion of the rule of law that led to their oppressive regimes. I need not use time today to discuss the rule of law in its domestic setting. We can all agree, I am certain, that at the core of the doctrine lies the separation of powers between the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, the independence of the judiciary, an independent legal profession, equality before the law, and fair process. If any of these principles is compromised, the consequences for democracy are devastating and destructive. But how do these principles apply in the international arena? How do they apply at the international level? The first and obvious difference between domestic and international uh, rule of law is that there is really no international legislature and there is no international executive. There is, however, a fast-growing international judiciary. Is this a paradox? I would suggest not. Although there is no international legislature, there are certainly international laws. Their sources are primarily international treaties or conventions and customary international law. 
They are based upon voluntary agreement of sovereign states. The absence of an international legislature makes lawmaking a little cumbersome and it makes it time consuming. But there is an inevitable consequence, but, but, but that is an inevitable consequence of the sovereignty of nations. Notwithstanding these difficulties and differences, there is certainly no shortage of international laws that touch on many aspects of all of our lives. These laws are universally respected and applied. There are laws that control civil aviation, civil aircraft overflying the airspace of sovereign nations, laws relating to posts and telecommunications, the law of the sea and international trade, and of course the rapid growth of literally hundreds of treaties on international criminal law dealing with drug trafficking, trafficking in people, extradition, refugees, war crimes, and terrorism. And more and more courts are being established to implement those laws. The Law of the Sea Tribunal, the appellate body of the World Trade Organization, the International Criminal Court, the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the mixed tribunals for Sierra Leone, Cambodia, and Lebanon, there are regional courts, such as the European Court of Justice, the European Court of Human Rights, the African Court of Justice, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and there are just too many sub-regional courts to mention. There are opinions and orders coming out of those courts in their hundreds, and almost daily. What is important is that the majority of those orders are honoured they are either complied with voluntarily or, or on occasions are enforced. The number of international and, and, and regional judges has grown exponentially. And I need hardly add that the legal profession has responded to what has become and what, is, and what is increasingly seen to be a growth industry. In this context, the absence of an international executive power is also troublesome. It makes the implementation of some international laws more difficult as their enforcement is subject to the, to the cooperation and goodwill of governments. However, as the world contracts, governments recognize more frequently the, import, the, the importance of reciprocity with regard to international laws and international order. For this reason, compliance and cooperation is growing. The rapid growth of international law has left little time for the consideration of the rule of law at this supranational level. Is the international judiciary, judiciary truly independent? How are international judges appointed? Is there a quality before the laws implemented by these international courts? Is due process recognized and implemented in trials and hearings before these courts? Is there an independent international bar? The report card to date, I would suggest, is a mixed one. There is much work to be done on improving the method of appointing the judges of many of these courts. Merit and not political expediency should be the rule. Oftentimes it is not. In some of the courts, the judges might well be independent, but a system of reappointment might well produce the fear of political expediency in some of their decisions. They are dependent on their government for reappointment, and that is likely to affect the fact, or at least the perception, of an absence of independence. There is no time today to consider these complex and interesting questions in depth. There is a plethora of issues here for students of the law and political science. And where better to follow these inquiries than at the Central European University? It has students from over 100 countries, faculty from over 30 countries, it places an emphasis on democracy and international human rights, and it now has a president and rector who has devoted his career to creating a better world for its entire people, and who has recognized that the law should be used to that end. I would like to spend what time I have remaining to turn to the importance of international justice and its contribution to the international rule of law. The starting point is impunity for war criminals. 
It is clearly inconsistent with, with an international rule of law to grant impunity to those who commit international war crimes. In South Africa, the former apartheid leaders of a white minority claimed blanket amnesties as the price for giving up power. For obvious reasons, they wanted impunity. It was more than sufficient, they claimed, with some justification, to expect them to hand over power to a black majority that had been cruelly oppressed by racial oppression for almost 350 years. To expect those white leaders, in addition to face Nuremberg-style trials and face prison sentences, was just too much to demand from them. They argued that there was no advantage in looking backward. There was too great and expensive an agenda in building a new and democratic South Africa. They, of course, were well aware of those awful crimes that had been committed in the enforcement of the apartheid laws. Some of them came to light in the investigations I conducted and to which reference was made during the last three years of apartheid. Fortunately, Nelson Mandela and his colleagues were not prepared to go the route of national amnesia. They were not prepared to sweep those past violations under the rug. The victims of apartheid demanded acknowledgement and our new leaders knew that there would be no peaceful transition without it. The result was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and discreet amnesties in return for full confessions. The outcome was a huge outpouring of evidence from over 21,000 victims of apartheid and applications for amnesties from over 7,000 people who claimed that they were perpetrators, and many of them were. That evidence established beyond any question and to the embarrassment of most white South Africans, what happened during those dark and evil years. The result is that today South Africa has a single history of the serious and many human rights violations that were committed in those bad years. That augurs well for the future. A comparable outcome has resulted from the work of the United Nations Ad Hoc, Tribunals for, Ad -hoc Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The testimony of hundreds of witnesses has laid bare the crimes that accompanied the terrible wars of the early 1990s and the egregious war crimes committed against thousands of innocent children, women and men. There too, the testimony of hundreds of witnesses put an end to the false denials that were so common in the aftermath of the criminality of evil leaders and their followers. Allow me to give you just one illustration. A member of the Bosnian Serb army, Drazen Erdemovic, was one of the members of an assassination squad outside Srebrenica in July 1995. The massacre of over 8,000 civilians, men and boys, was strenuously denied by the Bosnian Serb army. Then in early 1996, for personal reasons, Erdemovic decided to tell his story to an American television network, ABC. A journalist and a cameraman flew to Serbia from London and they met him uh, some, some kilometers outside Belgrade. He admitted to the journalist, and it was on, on, on camera, that he lost count after he had shot and killed over 70 of these innocent boys and men. He said he had objected to doing that, but his own life and the lives of his family were threatened if he didn't join the firing squad, and he proceeded with his ghastly role under huge, under huge duress. He also gave the journalist a map of the precise location where the mass grave was of the people that he had been responsible with others for shooting. The journalist fortunately left the map at the United States Embassy in Belgrade, and she then did a rather stupid thing. She called her London office from Belgrade to say that she had the video and she was on her way back to London. Well, she was met at Belgrade Airport by the Serb security police and the only videotape of the interview was confiscated and she was allowed to proceed with her journey. On her arrival in London, the journalist called me in a very emotional state. She understandably felt that she had placed the life, the life of Edemovic in jeopardy 
and asked whether I could assist in any way. I decided that the widest publicity to the event immediately was the best way to protect the life of Ademovich, and I obtained an order from a, from, the ju from a judge of the tribunal requesting the Serb government in Belgrade to transfer Ademovich to The Hague as a potential accused and as a witness to the events in Srebrenica. Fortunately for the tribunal, Ademovich was not a Serb national, and in order to garner financial assistance from the United States, Milosevic, to my great surprise, decided to accede to the request, and Ademovich was flown to The Hague. The Serb army continued to deny the massacre. They denied that there was a massacre at Srebrenica, and they ascribed the evidence of Ademovic to United States propaganda against Serbia. Well, we recovered the map that the journalist had left at the United States Embassy in Belgrade, and that enabled us to send the coordinates to the United States government. They very quickly sent us satellite photographs of the site of the massacre, and those photographs fully corroborated the information given to us by Ademovic. We had the grave exhumed, and the forensic evidence provided further crucial corroboration for what Ademovic had told us. The bodies exhumed from that grave were, were those of boys and men who had died in about the middle of 1995. All had their hands tied behind their back, and the cause of death was a single bullet wound to the head. That evidence effectively put an end to the false denials. It enabled the tribunal to convict Ademovic of crimes against humanity, and it formed the basis of subsequent findings of genocide against the Bosnian Serb leaders. In February of 2007, the International Court of Justice followed the, the United Nations Tribunal in finding that Serbia could have prevented what it, what it also held was genocide committed at Srebrenica. I need hardly tell you in this audience how important those events were for many thousands of members of the families of those murdered in the middle of 1995 outside Srebrenica. It brought them acknowledgement and closure. It allowed a large number of them to begin their own healing process. And of course, it put an end to the, to the false denials. And only one week ago, exactly a week ago today, the trial of Radovan Karadic began in The Hague. One of the charges against him is the genocide committed at Srebrenica. And the evidence of Ademovic will loom large at that trial. In Rwanda, the genocide that resulted in the deaths of some 800,000 innocent people was described in minute detail in the evidence placed before the Rwanda Tribunal, also set up by the United Nations Security Council. There were also denials, and they have stopped in the light of the evidence again of hundreds of witnesses. Absent these forms of justice, where the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions or prosecutions the societies in question would today be very different, and I would suggest that they would be more violent societies. South Africans can now rebuild my country in the knowledge that white South Africans have a debt to pay for what was done by them or in their name. Although an enduring peace has not come to the states of the former Yugoslavia, the cannons have been silent for some 14 years, and hopefully cycles of violence have been stopped in Rwanda. I have no doubt, too, that some form of justice is essential in the Middle East if there is to be an enduring peace there. In both the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, attacks were made on the institutions designed to bring the truth to light. It was primarily the perpetrators who cast doubt on the process of truth-making. They did what they could to prevent their establishment, and having been established, they did what they could to stop them from, from fulfilling their mandates. That they did not succeed was due in no small measure to the role of John Shattuck. It was my good fortune to be able to work with him and above all to rely on his wise advice and important encouragement. For that I will always be deeply grateful to him. It was through his efforts and those of Ambassador Albright that there is now a permanent international criminal court up and running in The Hague. It is now hard at work. It has the support of some 110 nations around the world, 
including that of every member now of the European Union. Its jurisdiction is making itself felt by many in capitals of countries accused of committing war crimes. It is the living proof that we no longer live in an age of impunity for war criminals. I trust that you can understand how much pleasure and satisfaction it gives me to be speaking on this wonderful occasion today. So please join me in congratulating John Shattuck on this important and exciting new assignment and wishing him a very successful and a very happy term of office. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Justice, Justice Richard Goldstone most sincerely on CEU's behalf for his words. Clearly the theme today emerging is humanity and international justice and their relationship to the ideals of open society on which CEU is founded. We are coming to the end of our ceremony. Thank you all for being here with us on this important day. The final act of our little drama is more music. It is fitting that we start and finish musically, not only because the chairman of our board is a distinguished conductor, but also because our new rector president is a lover of music and a great admirer of Budapest's musical tradition. We are already exploring ways in which we can have closer relations with the Franz Liszt Music Academy. Our closing piece is the fourth movement of Vorjak's New World Symphony. I would like to express our great thanks to the Budapest Philharmonic Orchestra for being with us and enhancing the beauty and dignity of this inauguration. After the music, there will be a reception to which you are all most welcome. <laughs>